Yeah, that's three examples for application layer protocol. Actually, uh, there are a lot of more application layer protocols we didn't cover. That is only to give you some example uh, to know a little bit about uh, what the application layer do. Now let's begin the transport layer. So the transport layer actually provide the end-to-end -end transmission or end-to-end -end connection. They can receive the data from the application layer protocol. So in application layer, they want to send a message to the internet. Actually, they didn't send the message directly to the internet. Instead, they transmit the message to the transport layer. And then the transport layer will add some header and then uh, send to the network layer and to lower, to lower until the internet. Okay. So transport layer will uh, receive data from the application layer and encapsulate the data and then send down. And we call a packet in the transport layer uh, to be segment. There are two typical transport layer protocol, TCP and UDP, which provide a reliable transfer protocol, and UDP provide a connectionless, unreliable uh, protocol. These are the header format of TCP and UDP protocol. Um, because TCP provide a lot more functions. So actually here in the header of TCP, they include more domain. So for example, uh, the common domain for TCP and UDP are the source port, the destination port. So typical, the port number um, is very important uh, for different application. Typically, they will uh, use different port in the computer, okay? So in both TCP and UDP header, we will have the source part, the destination part. The, and in UDP, they have a length. This is the total, the length of the total packet and some checksum, that's all, very easy. But for TCP, because we need to provide the reliable data transfer, so we need to give some um, ID or give the sequence number to every packet. And, and also, we will add some uh, window. This is used for uh, flow control and congestion control and, and uh, some other domains. So that is the header for TCP. Now let's look at some important concept one by one. So the first important concept is the port number. Just now we said that in the header of TCP protocol, you need to give the uh, source port number and destination port number. So what is port number? Actually, we have said that different applications use different parts to transmit data. So for example, uh, in your computer, you, you are running two applications. One is the web browser. Another one is the remote login. Then the web browser will send the message through port uh, 1024 and the telnet may send the message from the port uh, 1231 so different application use different port to send message so actually in the receiver uh, end it's very easy for it to transmit the corresponding message to the correct application according to the part. Okay, so that is part number. And for TCP connection, for the TCP, you need to know that um, they, to, to guarantee the reliable data transfer, actually TCP need to first set up a connection. So this is the sender, this is the receiver. For example, uh, before sending any data, they need first to, to set up a connection, or you can think of that is an end-to-end -end link. Okay. So um, how to set up this connection? The idea is very easy. The sender send a packet, meaning that I want to set up a connection. After receiving the message, the receiver sent back a message with its acknowledgement bit to be set. He said that, okay, I'm ready. Uh, you can set up and you can begin with this uh, sequence number. You can begin with A. 
and my message will begin with B. Uh, and then receive this message, the KC1 will add, uh, will send uh, acknowledgement feedback to tell it that, okay, I got it. Now a connection is established. So we call this uh, three-way, one, two, three, three-way handshake. After this handshake, these two uh, PC has agreed on this connection. Also, in TCP protocols, to guarantee that the packets are transmitted in sequence to the destination, they need to give the number, the sequence number to each packet. Actually, the sender numbers each byte of the a byte which should be transmitted to the receiver of the TCP. For example, in this packet, the first byte is A plus 1, the next byte is A plus 2, and the, the third one is A plus 3. Then the PC1 will give a sequence number of the number of the first byte as the sequence number of this packet. So the sequence number of this packet should be A plus 1 and then they send this packet into the receiver. The first byte uh, number is A plus 13. So in this packet, the sequence number should be A plus 13, which is also the number of the first byte. Because the intermittent transmission actually may not be reliable. So in the receiver part, when they receive the, the packets, Maybe it is out of order. So by checking the sequence number, they can know that, okay, uh, there, the, uh, I receive one, two, three, five. Then five is out of order. So I will ask for the packet four once again. And until packet four comes, I can send the five, six, seven to the upper layer. So in that case, the transmission can be in sequence. Look at the detailed number in sequence and act to understand the operation of TCP. So here, the number in sequence means the starting byte in this packet. And if you look at this from one to two uh, data transmission, you need to look at the sequence number of PC1 and the egg number of PC2. So the egg of PC2 means that I have correctly received the byte from A plus 1 to the byte uh, A plus 12. So the next expected byte is A plus 1 plus 12. So the number in the ACK means that I have correctly received the previous byte and the next byte is I expected is written here. Okay, so the PC1 after receiving this message, they can know that, okay, you have received all the byte before this number. Then I can send the byte from this number to you. Okay. And because this, the length is 66, if the receiver received this packet correctly, then he will tell the PC1 that the next byte I'm expecting will be A plus 12 plus 66. Okay, so there's one question. If I look at this direction data transmission from two to one, then how shall we analyze? Yes, we should analyze this sequence number and this egg. So, so here, one question is that why the egg number here is B plus one and the egg number here is still B plus one. Yes, you may notice that that is because in this packet, that is a pure acknowledgement packet. They have no payload. Here, the payload is zero. So the PC1 didn't receive more byte after this message. So the next byte they are expecting is still B plus one. So it's not changed. Right. Okay, 
the TCP actually uses the sliding window mechanism to control the data transmission rate. So, for example, uh, during the three-way handshaking, the receiver will first check the empty buffer size. For example, here, the receiver has three uh, empty buffer size, which means that it can receive at most three bytes. So they will write three into the window field and notify the sender that, okay, the maximum number of bytes you can send is three. And then at the data transmission stage, the sender can send at most three bytes. And then in the receiver, it will put each byte into the buffer and waiting for the upper layer to obtain the byte. Here, for example, all the buffer is full. And then here, the upper layer has already obtained one byte out. Then there are uh, one empty byte. So the receiver can tell the sender that, okay, now my window size has changed to one. At most, you can send one byte here. So this is the uh, mechanism of window sliding. It enables the receiver to control the sending rate of the sender. So here is one question. A, why does the window field of the segment sent by the PC1 remains unchanged? So you see that the window field sent by the PC1, here is three, here is three, and here, 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 all of them are three. Why? Why it is remain unchanged? Okay, think of that. Yeah, that is because uh, from the receiver, from the PC1 point of view, first, they have three bytes empty buffer size. And uh, during all the stage, the PC2 sent no packet, no byte to uh, PC1. So from PC1's point of view, the buffer is still empty. Uh, the buffer size is still three without changing. So the window field they notified PC2 remains unchanged, remains three. After the data transmission, uh, finally, the TCP connection should be shut down uh, to release the resource uh, allocated to this connection. And for shutdown, typically they use the four-way handshake. It's a little bit complicated than the connection established. In the established, we are three-way handshaking, right? So for the shutdown, actually, the standard if the transmission from one to two um, is finished, then this PC1 can try to uh, finish this connection. They first send a packet with the fin domain set to be one. And then the PC2, after receive this fin packet, they will send uh, an egg packet. After receiving this app packet, PC1 will not receive, uh, will not transmit any data later on. And to close the data transmission from 2 to 1, actually the PC2 needs to send a message, which is the fin message. And then the PC1 send back the feedback, the app message. So Using this fin message and fin egg message, the transmission from two to one can be closed. So until these two connections data transmission are both finished, the TCP connection can be shut down. Okay. And why this message cannot be integrated into one message? That is because after this direction's transmission finish, actually the PC2 may still have some data need to be transmitted back. So the PC2 need to wait. Until all the data in this direction finish the transmission, they can send the fin message out. So we need at least four message for TCP shutdown.